The next day, the entrance to the mansion was lined with towering maples spaced out evenly, dipping down into a grove from which a pinkish mansion eventually emerged, the pillars holding up the artifice. The next day, all the cars were gone from the mansion's grounds, dirt lot. She parked. As she got out, Lane saw some of the youth from Juvenile Detention Center taking the stakes out of the ground and putting them in the back of a man's truck as part of their community service hours. The flags that went around the tents were wound up in piles. Other than that, the grounds were deserted from the night before. What did the grounds in the story represent? Somewhere in prehistoric Ireland? Somewhere in the midst of the cattle raid, maybe? Lane entered the mansion through the back entrance, ducking under the vine-covered lattice where she took her senior pictures so long ago, until she was under the Grecian-style columns of the back terrace. My, the contrast between the golden grassy field and the rising purple mountains, she thought, gazing at the open cattle field between her the tree-covered highway in the distance, which she could hear, and the booming canyons marking their territory. She could imagine seeing the outline of the posh stable Daly had built for his prize-winning horse, Tammany, on his roughly 11 acres. Daly had done horse racing as a hobby. That was one lucky horse, Tammany. The children's home wasn't far away. A five-minute drive, maybe. One had to take Old Corvallis Road to get there. A bucolic paradise of greenhouses, Victorian houses, and rich stretches of golden grasslands. Old Corvallis ran parallel to Highway 93 connecting the small valley towns with Missoula, Montana, where the airport was, and with Darby going in the opposite direction towards Lost Trail Ski Resort and sniffing into Idaho, as Mom always said. They were the nostril of Montana. She stumbled on the last step of the long marble steps, looking over her shoulder at the breathtaking expanse. Cattle prodded in the sunshine, overlooking the wide expanse of grazing cows and the mountains blazing like angry purple flames in the distance. Logic Canyon looked most inhospitable, like a vanished gray granite statue falling jagged on the floor. Sometimes Lane had dreams of visiting an ancient prehistoric site where people littered and the ancient treasures were defaced by rotten teenagers, and it made her want to weep at some historic place which contained lessons that would fill the modern era with ancestral wisdom and the feeling that she would never fully comprehend. Opening the door, she stepped down a long hall and was distracted by what looked like an old jukebox on the wall. She had a quarter in her pocket. It was next to a pebble and a piece of lint, she had to look in the eye sockets to see the image clearly, and she could see the vast wilderness around Mr. Daly. A wilderness before any buildings ex existed. He wore a monocle, even though he reminded her of Mr. Moneybags on the Monopoly game. But back then he was just a young visionary from Ireland. It's so beautiful here, even if it makes for a hard living, she said under her breath, moving her foot out to take another glance at the mountains and field through the doors and where Tammany's stable was somewhere. She looked it up on her phone and found out the machine she was looking into was called a mudoscope. 
It was just like the one at Virginia City, where she and her family took a family vacation a long time ago. Except that one showed a Roaring Twenties peep show. Lane remembered how mom, dad, and she went there. She remembered the colorful houses built on the slope. At the diner, dad drank coffee from a John Wayne mug. Mom had bought him at the souvenir shop. She liked to watch him drink from that cup and might have even taken a photo. They watched the purple pimpernel in the old theater behind the bar that was once a cabaret where Lane saw a belt like the one Mom had in her underwear drawer. It was a five-cent buffalo coin linked together on a chain. As Lane inserted the quarter, she looked through the machine. This film didn't show a peep show, but an image of Marcus Daly himself standing in an open field. And the recording began to play. It's one of the largest untapped coal deposits in the western mountains, Daly said, as he began to walk around. Soon I'm going to own it, and with my copper mines will come towns, roads, railroads, churches, and even a few schools. And then totally cut off, he looked at Lane and said, I'd like to make a small donation to your creative endeavors. Although I don't share your lofty ideals, I appreciate what you have accomplished. Yeah, right, Lane said, shaking her head, looking down. A little smile etched on her face. It seemed there always remained in her a spark of imagination. It fortified her with a childlike sense of wonder, no matter what was happening around her. They were about to start the meeting, and Lane heard Gwen calling it into order. As she walked down the hallway, she spotted a hand-sewn quilt on one of the beds in one of the rooms. It was made of a thousand different pieces that did not look uniform at all, but somehow came together. She ducked into the kitchen area around a table of antique gadgets hung around the wall. There, seated in a circle of chairs, were Sally from India, Marilyn, Gwen, Frank, Kennedy. She thought that was all of them. Frank's muck boots stuck out awkwardly from the white plastic chair he sat. He was Fergus to a T in the tale of the cattle raid. Fergus was Maeve's lover, while her husband was King Aleel. Fergus used to be one of the Ulster men, but was tricked by Maeve's army into betraying the sons of Usna and joining Maeve's army. Frank painted Gwen's house. <laughs> Maybe he really did paint her house. Anything on Evelyn? Gwen asked. She keeps begging to get a pet, Marilyn said. Yeah, not going to happen, Gwen said. No pets were allowed at the children's home. Their meetings were full of tangents and wild loops. Give me some of that, Gwen said, seeing a pie being passed around. Sally had just given a lecture on how the pie Lane brought in was full of fake artificial chemicals from the pistachio she'd bought at the store. Look at the color of that artificial pistachio pudding, Sally said. Marilyn and her were on the plastic chairs going on about the ocean and the things that were not supposed to be in it. Marilyn said, Scientists are putting spider DNA into cows, and these fibers come out in the milk like spider webs, but are super strong. That's weird. I know, right? I don't care. I'd sell my daughter for a piece of that, Gwen said. In the story, Maeve had offered up her daughter's friendly thighs to any man that dared fight Kukulin. The sea home and bee home were at war, and Lane's boss, Gwen, was Queen Maeve herself, who to Lane seemed so much like her it was uncanny. Lane went into the full fantasy mode again. In Lane's mind, Gwen was a proud, cunning, promiscuous Queen Maeve from the Cattle Raid. She was a badass warrior chick 
who could have any man and everyone wanted to be like her. The other day, I was making dinner for the next night's meal, Kennedy said, and Evelyn came out. Carlos was like, damn, Evelyn, you look like an 80-year-old woman. I was like, Carlos! What did Evelyn say, said another staff. She was like, shut up, it's not my fault, they changed my meds again. The staff as a whole were pretty sure Carlos had snuck into Evelyn's room between bed checks, but he denied it. Why else had her window been busted open? And that Carlos and Evelyn had relations that they were too young to understand the meaning of. Lane thought, It was not uncommon for an Irish hero to sleep with a haggard old witch, only to find her transformed into a beautiful princess. In ancient Ireland, women were prized for their intelligence above all else. A warrior's true integrity was based on his ability to see beyond physical attractiveness. She also thought sometimes it didn't seem like they were helping the kids at all, but gossiping about them around a big oak table. Lane thought this story she was writing into her reality was getting so weird. And she didn't know if she was accurately portraying things or saying what she was meaning to say at all. But somehow she felt like she was doing the right thing. What she was meaning to say was she knew how hard it was to break these generational patterns and trauma bonds. And since she knew the truth, didn't she have a responsibility to at least try to say it in her own words? Music licensing reimagined. Thanks for watching my video, guys. I'll be back with another video next Wednesday. Till then, ciao.